I take this opportunity now to introduce the moderator of the panel. As soon as people in the back, such as Ramesh, are sitting down, Ramesh Raskar, take a seat. <laughs> okay, if I, if I know the name of anybody else standing up, I will repeat that name, so you take a seat. Okay, great, thanks a lot. Um, I'm sorry I have to hurry this on, but we ran a little bit late. I apologize for that. Um, this next panel uh, is moderated by Dr. Chris Rowan, who is the founder and CEO of Cognite Ventures. He's a well-known Silicon Valley entrepreneur and technologist. He joined Cadence after its acquisition of Tensilica, which is a company that he founded uh, to develop extensible processors. And before founding Tensilica in 1997, he was VP and GM of the Design Reuse Group at Synopsys. He was also a pioneer in developing risk architecture and he helped found uh, MIPS Computer Systems where he was VP of Microprocessor Development. Uh, he owns an MS and a doctorate from Stanford University, yay, and he has more than 40 U US um, and international uh, patents. He was named IEEE Fellow in 2015 um, and he started Cognate Ventures in 2016 to develop, advise, and invest in new entrepreneurial ventures, especially around cognitive computing, and hence its name, Cognite Ventures. Um, there's a lot of cognitive computing in uh, AR and custom design processor, um, and, and the custom uh, design processor in the HoloLens was developed by Tensilica, which, as you may remember, is the company that Chris founded. And I just want to read uh, a little quote from, from a a blurb that I read on the web, which is that this uh, processor has 24 10 silica DSP cores arranged in 12 clusters. It has 65 million logic gates, 8 megabytes of SRAM, and a layer of 1 gigabyte of low power DDR3 RAM on top, all in a 12 millimeter by 12 millimeter BGA package. It performs a trillion calculations a second. Um, it reads like a spec for a car, <laughs> um, but that's what you need. Uh, you need all that horsepower, and um, I want to thank Dave Single for bringing Chris uh, Rowan in to us to, to moderate this panel. I think it's a very important topic, and I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joyce. You know, it really is a fascinating topic when you see this really compelling uh, new form factor and at least what is projected, what has been prototyped, what has been shown in the potential for this. But clearly um, there is much more to do and clearly the problems we're dealing with are intensive in memory, they're intensive in bandwidth, they're intensive in computation and so it's a, at least a good likelihood that the silicon matters a lot and the purpose of this panel is to figure out in what ways does the silicon matter a lot? Uh, does the silicon matter enough? Uh, what are the things we may be able to anticipate about future platforms and how they will co-evolve with this uh, new form factor or class of form factors? So the format here is really intended to stir things up. So I hope that we'll get to the point where we're getting a good number of questions. Um, it's late in the day, so it's important to have some fun. Um, I'm going to very briefly introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to let them uh, do uh, their own more in-depth introduction of their point of view. There are absolutely no slides. We are going to entirely be shooting from the hip uh, and giving, uh, you know, real, raw, unformatted uh, sorts of... Uh, sorts of responses. So, um, starting at this side, we have uh, Liang Peng, who is the Senior Director of Technical Planning and Strategy uh, in the IC lab of Huawei uh, in the US. Uh, and then um, we've got um, uh, Hugo, is, um, serves as the Senior Director of Product Management for Qualcomm, uh, particularly focused on uh, uh, consumer electronics products like AR and drones and robots and things near and dear to our hearts. 
Um, we have Ian Bratt, who is a distinguished engineer at ARM, and he's been working most intensively recently as an architect for the Mali family of GPUs. Uh, we have uh, then further on down Michael Cass, who is the senior principal engineer in the new technology group at Intel, uh, working uh, largely in computer vision and uh, related visual problems. And uh, finally, we have uh, uh, David Lubica, who is the Vice President of Graphics Research at NVIDIA. So, please welcome the, the panelists. And actually, I'm going to start at that end. <laughs> and, uh, you know, say a bit about yourself and your point of view on silicon platforms and AR. What are the issues that we should be wrestling with today? You bet. Um, so as you heard, I'm Dave Lupke. I'm the Vice President of Graphics Research at NVIDIA, and uh, that includes a lot of things that you might expect, like real-time rendering for computer games and, and high-quality rendering uh, for offline purposes. Uh, but it also includes a, a relatively small group that uh, is focused on AR and VR, and that's what uh, I personally supervise and sort of gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, and. Uh, you know, we're focused and we're thinking about uh, the intersection of display and optics and rendering and human perception. Okay, so I, I, that, that's a mouthful, but, but I, think that, I think that you really do have to consider all of those. You heard people say how interdisciplinary this field is. And uh, I, I think we're tackling all of the problems that you, you've heard about, trying to think about ultra-low latency displays. Um, trying to think about foveated displays, trying to think about how a foveated display plays upstream in the rendering algorithms and the silicon that embeds those rendering algorithms. How does, you know, how, how does foveation, for example, ripple upstream to the, to the architecture and eventually even to the content development pipeline? Um, so uh, the fo focus cues, field of view, resolution, all of the things you've heard, they're all critical. We're, we're, we're thinking about each of them. Uh, and, and, and like I said, this is really what I sort of think about, you know, in the shower in the morning. Uh, <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> and, and I've got out of bed, I'm in the shower, next I'm gonna drive to work. Uh, and, and, and I would say that the, um, you know, uh, Chris said, you know, what's, a, what's an important trend or a challenge sort of facing, you know, for, you know when he was sort of prepping us for the panel. And, and uh, the one I wanted to sort of call to your attention, you know, is that Moore's Law is over, right? Uh, let's, let's, not, let's not make any bones about it. There, you know, it's, it's basically done. Uh, there is no more free ride. Uh, all of the innovation, the next several steps of innovation are going to come from being clever about our algorithms, being clever about how we embed them into architecture. Um, uh, so uh, I think that's a huge challenge. Um, the way I, I looked up some statistics, the uh, uh, iPhone 7 has roughly the power of the 500th computer on the top 500 supercomputer list in 2002. So a 2002 era supercomputer is now in your pocket, but your current laptop your, will probably never fit on your head, right, unless we have some utter breakthrough. So from, that has huge implications for silicon and also mundane things like form factor. Maybe actually we won't fit the entire computer on your head for the truly challenging graphics. Maybe we have to use the cloud, maybe we have to use a belt pack, maybe we have to use the PC on the other side of the room. So I think that that's just an interesting challenge I'd like to sort of throw out there to people thinking about this. I'll stop there. Yeah, let's keep coming down the line, Michael. Thanks. Um, so um, I'm Michael Cass. Um, I sort of started out as a computer vision guy. Um, did my research at uh, MIT and uh, uh, for my master's, and did my PhD here in the electrical engineering department. Started to get interested in uh, problems on the boundary between um, vision and graphics. Then I went all the way over to graphics. So I, um, I spent uh, five years in um, Apple's advanced technology group and then uh, 18 years at Pixar and um, then steered towards AR, VR. I spent uh, uh, some time at Magic Leap as a distinguished fellow there and now I'm at uh, Intel where I'm um, in, an architect in the new technology group. So the new technology group is um, the group that's responsible for 
everything at Intel that's not a traditional computing device, so it's not a, um, it's not a PC, it's not a, a laptop or a desktop or a tablet or a phone or any of those traditional form factors, but other sorts of devices. So obviously that includes um, you know, AR and VR, which I'm uh, involved with, uh, as well as uh, keeping my finger in, in various other projects in computer vision and, and computer graphics. So um, the question is, you know, what, are, what, what are some of the issues that I see coming up? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention three. Um, first off, nobody really knows what AR is going to be good for, right? There's going to, I mean, most of us believe it's going to be good for something. It's going to be really good for something. And uh, eventually the, the so-called killer app will come out. But if I look at where we are today and, you know, with a little historical perspective, it reminds me of the early days of the uh, home personal computer, and people were saying like, okay, well, we got these computers in business, and we know they're useful there, and uh, now we can cost reduce them, we can stick one in your home, what are you gonna do with it? And if you read the stuff at the time, or if you were there, it's pretty darn ridiculous. I mean, people were saying, um, yeah, so housewives are gonna use these computers to put all their recipes on them, and it's gonna be so great, and that's, you know, that's like, the main value of these computers in the home is you're going to have all your recipes on them. Um, and, the, you know, the reality is that a $1,000 or whatever, multi-thousand dollar computer didn't really do a lot more for you at that time than a bunch of index cards with recipes on them. So, no, that wasn't what took off. And it took a while, but eventually the, the first killer app that happened was, was VisiCalc. So that was, um, you know, the beginning of spreadsheets, and that took over the... The, the universe. So at some point we're going to find a killer app for, for, um, for AR um, and it's going to be the thing that is then going to motivate the silicon capabilities that we need. So for example because VisiCalc was the first dominant uh, killer app in the, in the PC market, um, how important was floating point? Not very, right? We weren't doing finite element analysis at home. We were um, doing spreadsheets with a little bit of math every so often, but mostly it was following pointers around and, and that sort of thing. So, so that colored the evolution of the PC chip. The, the silicon evolved because of the applications that were important, that were economically important. Um, and that's why we didn't end up getting a lot of floating point capability in PCs until we got to the stage where, oh, well, we have all these extra transistors, what can we spend them on that would be useful? And having exhausted all the other alternatives and putting big caches on things, we're like, oh, okay, I guess we can put um, uh, floating point units on and extend the, the, the value there. So that's sort of the first thing is that in order to know what the, how the silicon's going to evolve, you can't really answer that very effectively, I don't think, without an idea of who's going to be using it, what they're going to be doing, and that I think is currently very much in flux. Uh, I will say, I think it's, it's uh, more in flux than maybe most people realize. When I hear some of the, some marketing folks confidently um, extol the virtues of of AR, they say you're going to be wearing this thing all the time, and you're going to like you're going to do media consumption, and you're going to use this as your virtual desktop, and and, and you know there's a variety of reasons why that may very well not happen. Um, if I want to watch a movie, if it's a completely passive experience, I'm not really interacting with it. Then if I have an AR display where everything is ghostly, as we've mentioned before, because you don't have pixel by pixel occlusion then uh, your contrast is worse everywhere, right? You're seeing other things through it. That's gonna, that makes the experience worse. If you're gonna have um, you know, this virtual desktop, great. Do you wanna be reading text, which is partially transparent? Um, we're gonna figure out what it's good for, but it's not, I bet, the things that we're currently doing that we're just gonna put onto AR and, and move away. AR has some, some great promise. You can, um, potentially interact with things in completely different ways, right? You, for the storytelling opportunities are, are amazing. You have a medium which understands where you're looking at it. Um, so my Pixar director buddies, you know, they're incredibly excited about the possibility of doing this, but it's going to require developing a lot of new technology which we don't have uh, currently in the market. So that evolution is going to be something that we'll have to watch and guide and, and see where that goes. Um, so the uh, second one is that I, I want to bring up, the second issue is uh, the way, w what's the time frame over which this uh, takes off? So what do we build these devices out of today? We build these devices out of things which are cheap. And why are they cheap? They're cheap because they're in cell phones, right? The whole Oculus, you know, VR thing, that wouldn't have started without the existence of 
displays, systems on the chip, other pieces, components, which are cheap because we have hundreds of millions of cell phones in the world. So there will be a time when VR volumes and AR volumes together get to the point where they can drive the silicon. Today we take literal cell phone silicon and we build stuff out of it. There will be a time in the future where we take those things and we modify them a little bit to make them better for uh, AR and VR in ways that don't increase the cost too much for cell phones. Right? There's a future beyond that where we project enough volume that we can design chips that are primarily for that purpose. But that takes a lot of volume. If you have a, a system on a chip kind of effort that takes you, you know, costs you somewhere between 10 and 100 million dollars, if you're selling only 100,000 units, it doesn't make any sense. You're going to be paying 100 to 1,000 dollars per unit in engineering costs. So as we understand better what the uptake looks like, that will inform what makes any economic sense and what people are willing to spend money in, and design. The third issue that I wanted to bring up is um, the location of that computation. So obviously, we all have this vision, I think it's pretty much shared, of the ultimate AR device. It's small, it's light, it's low power, it's high resolution, um, it is completely aware of its surroundings at all times, it, it knows everything about everything, it's completely helpful to you in all situations, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and any real device is going to be a compromise. And there are many dimensions on which we can compromise, and a lot of people have made suggestions on what those could be. Um, but one of the ways to compromise is if you can figure out how to move computation off of the head-worn device somewhere else, then obviously that reduces the power that you have, that reduces the potential weight, the comfort, the cost, all those things can get, can get better there. So the question is, and, uh, and I, I think this isn't uh, really open, as this progresses, as we move towards our nirvana, um, do we need devices where everything is either on your head, does that be on your head or you know, on your body somewhere else, belt, pocket, wherever? Um, or is it, does it actually make more sense that you're somehow wirelessly connected to some computing that's uh, very nearby or far away? We've uh, heard people talk about the cloud, obviously, you know, to some, the cloud, you picture an Amazon data center that's hundreds of miles away, that has a certain minimum latency. But, you know, we can imagine a future where, where computing gets more ubiquitous. It, it could be your, your laptop, it could be your desktop, it could be that, you know, computing devices are, are all around. And, and, and so there's lots of things that you can do where you communicate quickly, low latency to things that are much closer than the traditional cloud, and that will affect what goes on your head uh, and therefore what the silicon has to look like. So yeah. those are some issues I just wanted to raise and get people to think about. Thanks. Um, Ian? Uh, hi, my name is Ian Brott. I'm a distinguished engineer at ARM. Uh, I spent, I'm a member of the architecture and technology group. I spent several years at ARM uh, architecting Mali GPUs. So for those of you that don't know, Mali GPUs are a family of GPU uh, provided by ARM. I think last year, uh, ARM partners shipped over 1 billion units with Mali GPUs, so there are a few out there. Um, so going back to this question as to kind of future silicon platforms for, for AR, VR, and, and where we spend our time thinking, you know, I can't help but, but view things through, through my lens from, from the mobile SOC perspective, you know. Um, Michael mentioned that today we use mobile SOCs because they're cheap. Um, but that actually does not mean they're not sophisticated. They're cheap because the, the economies of scale are just so enormous, but they're actually incredibly sophisticated SOCs. And uh, if you look at the problems mobile SOCs solve today, there's actually, there's three main kind of, um, I guess, classes of things going on. So there's a huge amount of sensor data, camera data, video data, whatever. Uh, there's an enormous amount of compute, and it's also different types of compute. There's signal processing, uh, there's actually more and more neural network compute, there's classic CPU compute, um, and then there's enormous amounts of data movement. And actually you have all three of these things in a very limited thermal budget. So uh, uh, earlier it was mentioned that there's the end of Moore's law is making, forcing people to be more clever. 
but actually the, the thermal budgets in the SOC space have been forcing SOC designers for mobile phones to be clever for a very long time. So we have to be much more efficient. You can't just throw more GPU area in a cell phone because it'll just use up too much power. So you have to find ways to be very efficient and clever. Uh, so when I think about that and those, those problems that mobile SOCs uh, solve and I listen to the folks in this room, I actually think they're very similar to the AR, VR problems. So there's a lot of sensor data, there's a lot of data movement, and then there's a lot of different classes of compute all within this thermal envelope. So, you know, what I think about is actually not whether or not mobile SOCs will be kind of the, the future platform for AR, VR, but actually what path they'll take to get there because I think they've been solving these same problems for a very long time and have a lot of expertise. Yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, I'm a little bit uh, angry with you. You stole the, <laughs> all my uh, points. Um, not, not surprisingly, coming from Qualcomm. But uh, yeah, my name is uh, Hugo Swart, uh, Senior Director of uh, Product Management. Uh, 14 years at, uh, at Qualcomm. Uh, good part of it uh, in our R&D division looking into five, uh, ten-year technology, um, uh, new technologies. And for the last, uh, let's say, five years or so, uh, came into the product management division of uh, our uh, business unit, QCT, uh, and responsible to take our Snapdragon uh, silicon to adjacent markets to smartphones. Right, I think uh, the, the key ones, of course, uh, VR and AR, uh, but also looking to other uh, spaces like uh, robotics, drones, that interestingly enough share uh, many of uh, the, the uh, same problems that we see in VR and AR when it comes to computer vision, uh, neural networks, deep learning, and, and so forth. Uh, when, uh, you know, when, when my product managers ask me, hey, what, you know, next step, what do we need to do? What, you know, what are the, the, the things that we need to focus on on our next uh, generation um, uh, chips? Uh, we generally, when we look into AR, uh, there are three big buckets, right, of um, features or, or IPs that, uh, that we work on. Uh, first are, you know, IPs uh, related to immersion. Right? I think a lot was said today about uh, GPU graphics, uh, CPU, um, uh, video engines, right, that, that go 4K, 120, 8K in the, in the future. So um, the multimedia piece, right? So of course, uh, that's critical. Um, and and, um, uh, and we, are, we need to continue investing uh, on that front. So that's the first bucket. Um, uh, second uh, bucket, uh, cognitive uh, functions, computer vision functions, right? So uh, we need to look into uh, how to accelerate some of these algorithms uh, in hardware. Right? We don't want to be using you know, CPU and GPU that you, know, you want to use for your main application to run these algorithms. So we are, are looking heavily into uh, either dedicated hardware or DSP with our uh, uh, Qualcomm version HVX uh, that we can uh, do these algorithms in a more efficient way, especially power efficient way. So that's uh, the second um, bucket. Right, cognitive functions, computer vision, uh, context awareness, and, and so forth. Uh, the third bucket uh, that uh, maybe surprisingly I haven't heard uh, much today, uh, but connectivity. Right. So I think uh, when we look into AR as this uh, holy grail, you know, maybe the HMD uh, that you know you walk with it the whole day, you carry the whole day. Well, you need to be always connected. Right. The same way that your our smartphones are always connected. Uh, we need it um, in AR HMDs and um, maybe even at faster and lower latency um, uh, than what we, we have in, in, in smartphones. So I think, uh, uh, you know, today we take it for granted, right, connectivity, uh, but we really need to be looking at what are the connectivity requirements for these AR HMDs. A lot, you know, is being done in the 5G, 5G realm. Um, but, I mean, you, we have to look at connectivity from a wireless WAN, wireless LAN, and, and even, um, you know, within the body. So these are the three buckets and, um, uh, that, that we're looking at, and we have, uh, you know, roadmaps um, in these three buckets to address AR uh, HMDs. And um, um, before passing to the next um, 
colleague. Uh, I mean, one thing that we um, are seeing at Qualcomm is, um, uh, is, is that we feel that in AR, we, today, we're the same way where we, when we started the first smartphones, or even the first phones, right? 30 years ago, right, you imagine, you know, those big phones that, you know, uh, maybe you had to plug it in into, into the car, um, and that's where we probably are today uh, in AR. So after, you know, a few years, some disruptive technologies come, touch, better displays, the first smartphone comes in. And then you have the first apps, right, the first uh, ecosystems, uh, that, you know, multiply the use cases of, uh, of the phones. Um, and we believe uh, we're going to follow pretty much the same way in AR as to what we saw in, in phones and then smartphones. Each year, you know, incrementally better. Um, and then, you know, you look at the course of 10 years and you say, wow, what have we created? So that's the, the vision that we have at Qualcomm. Yep. Snapdragon, with you, it's a great start uh, for, you know, the first generation devices. And we're looking now into what do we need to do year over year, uh, similar to what uh, was done in the phone space. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Liang? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Liang Pen. Um, I, um, I work for Huawei, lead the, the uh, tech planning team in the US uh, IC lab. And uh, the reason why I got involved into AR VR is because uh, I was, have a very good uh, background in computer graphics. So about uh, 23 years ago, I was a PhD student at uh, Cornell University. In fact, I was uh, sponsored by someone in this room, <laughs> <laughs> pay for my tuition and doing research. But at that time, I had the uh, opportunity to, um, to get introduced about the, the, uh, the first time uh, the head mount device, uh, display device. Somebody in the UNC did the project. And, and I quickly, I noticed that the, the motion was so slow when the people move around, you know, the, the display just track very slowly. But there's somebody tell me that uh, don't worry about this because uh, semiconductor, the advancement of uh, semiconductor and a Moore's law going to change all of those. And I believe that I come to the Silicon Valley. <laughs> and then in my first uh, job, well, actually second job at the um, Silicon Valley uh, that I had the honor to work with a great company, NVIDIA, that uh, uh, I have the opportunity to work on the first uh, pixel shader of the GPU. And then that's a great project, and not only it becomes a foundation for the graphics, it changes the, you know, making uh, graphical rendering a lot more flexible and create a more realistic, uh, a photorealistic rendering, but also becomes a foundation for the uh, AR, VR, and also for the AI's uh, computing as of today. So um, I have the reason to believe in the future, uh, going forward for many, many years, uh, and this uh, computing or the hardware advancement uh, will going to continue. But uh, uh, at least a lot of, um, a lot of challenges. Uh, one is to make things render well and uh, you know, serve a, the need for the future AR, VR application. Um, we have to you know, do a lot better than today's uh, uh, computing model. We have to factor all the human perception model. I think some of the people here are the world expert on those. We have to put those things in our, not only in our simulator, but in our silicon so that uh, we can actually accelerate those, doing a lot more computing. But it, this is a very, very challenging because the thermal uh, constraint is, uh, is our biggest enemy. We have to find a good solution for it not only at the, the you know, device level, but also at the very, very fundamental level, like a manufacturer level, foundry level. We need to find a good uh, transistor and a semiconductor device and can, which can produce a very, very low power um, you know, computing to providing those function. That's one thing. And also at the architecture level, whether it's a, a kind of like a super dedicated uh, hardware solution or even GPU is still part of that, uh, or you know, doing some system level partition, like uh, having the device computing somewhere, and then having the is a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi to to pass the, the signal and the data to the um, display device, um, which is uh, much less constrained power. So that's one thing. The third point I want to make is actually very similar to uh, 
my colleague from Qualcomm, um, I think the connectivity. So the computing not necessarily uh, at the, the, the local, but uh, you might have a uh, you know, very distant guy uh, computing and doing the interaction with you, uh, teleportation. And, and also those things are very, very important. You have to not only make sure those guys are interact uh, um, you know, correctly, but also with a very low latency so that the, the in interaction is uh, seamlessly. So that's a very, very challenge uh, with the big bandwidth uh, and also with the low latency. And that's, uh, uh, I think, Huawei has a unique position with both computing and uh, communication. Thanks. All day, we've been implicitly or explicitly talking about the question of what does it take for AR to go mainstream? And there really are two ways of coming at it. And, and Michael alluded to one, which is, what's the reason that people will adopt it? What is the killer app? What is it that we will discover we want to do with it? But the other perspective is also, what are the things that may keep people from adopting it? What are aspects of the experience, whether it's the quality of the, of the, the display or the, the dealing with motion or the... Uh, the, uh, you know, capture of gestures or the vision capabilities, what are the things that will be objections that have to be overcome? So what is, in your minds, the role for improved silicon platform technologies to A, help us find the killer app, or B, overcome the objections that make it an unsatisfying experience for some today. Yeah. I mean, maybe I can start with uh, uh, removing a little bit of the barriers, right, for mass yeah. uh, uh, adoption. Well, first, I think we have to look maybe into from an enterprise angle and consumer. Right. And I'll, I'll take the question as more from a consumer because that's where, you know, generally you'll see a greater amount of volume. So, so I think uh, first is, I mean, we, it has to be something small, mm -hmm. right? Um, lightweight, uh, and at the same time provide uh, amazing uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. So, so when, when I think about uh, okay, light, small, and 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 then I mean amazing experiences. Uh, I mean we have to think about size. The size of the PCB of the silicon has to be small. Mm -hmm. You have to make small packages. You have to make uh, pop type of uh, uh, configuration where you have memory and and uh, stacked on on, on top. Um, so that's how, you know, we, we think about making it um, uh, smaller and, and easier to fit uh, on, a, on, a, on a glass. Uh, the other way to think about uh, small is similar to a few of the comments made is uh, power, right? You cannot afford, you know, put a, a fan, right, on, on an all-in-one type of, uh, of a glass. So it needs to be at the high performance at, at low power. So we have to take, you know, what we have done in mobile to the next level, right? So, I mean, uh, increase the amount of performance at the same time lowering uh, the power because, well, um, we have to uh, dissipate more heat to generate this kind of uh, graphics. And at the same time, uh, the, the space is even smaller than, than a phone. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, I mean, those are the uh, impacts on, uh, uh, the key impacts on, on silicon, being able to uh, do the... Uh, um, heavy multimedia, all the computer vision algorithms, mm -hmm. uh, plus yep. connectivity in a short or small uh, power budget that can fit on a, on a, on a small phone factor. Yeah. Other thoughts? So I'll make a kind of a concrete, uh, I'll try to answer with sort of an example or, or a, a Please. More, more of a flyer, a proposal. Yeah. Um, a crazy thought. <laughs> I, I, I would claim that a, a killer app or a killer requirement maybe of, of successful AR in either consumer or enterprise is going to be ultra low power, ultra high quality text. Okay, so you talk about what could ruin your experience. You can't read eight point font, you know, in today's GP, in today's uh, GPUs, in today's uh, head mounts, right? And <clears throat> uh, the ability to, to just just simply read eight point font at a, at a meter away, you know, something I do all the time in the real world uh, is, is a good example of something that I think is, I, we take so for granted that we would be loath to give it up. Right. Um, 
Uh, is that overcoming an day. objection or is that the killer app? It's kind of both uh, because I think if you do have super high quality text, then an enormous amount of what you do on your phone can be ported, ported, to, your, um, ported to your glasses. And, and, and I brought this up in the context of sort of what is something you can imagine doing custom silicon for, whether it's a unit somewhere on your, on your SOC or something you know, like the HPU really close to your display, um, a little dab of silicon. Uh, I, would, I would say ultra low power, ultra high quality text. Just, yeah. just a sort of a crazy idea to float out there as an example that could overcome objections and or be sort of a killer app. Yeah. Other thoughts? Uh, yeah, I would say um, there are different interesting design points. Um, one interesting design point is let's make the thing as small and light as possible, um, something that you are willing to wear virtually all the time and accept whatever compromises come from that. Um, because Honestly, you know, um, if you need to do things differently, depending on whether the thing is with you or not, its value is dramatically reduced. So something that can really always be around, you know, like what, part of the value of the cell phone, um, you know, it's got a camera, right? What's the best camera? It's a camera that's with you. Uh, I have lots of better cameras, but they're not with me all the time. So this is, I think, a, a, a key, really interesting design point. Then. There's this other, um, and that design point should be something that does not make you look weird, right? That you're willing to wear <laughs> in public, you know, ideally, right? That would be the, that would be the perfect thing. Even if the capabilities are ex extremely reduced, like we, we just say, okay, um, it's got to last for this long, it has to have this much power, um, therefore it can only, you know, and it has to fit in this space, it can only do this, that's it. We accept that, but it's always with you. That's very cool. The other thing is um, you want all these additional capabilities. OK, well, maybe you want to just relax the other requirements there and say, uh, OK, I'm only going to use this um, at home or where in the course of my job when people expect it. And so I don't have to worry about some of these social issues as much. And then I'm, in return for that, I'm going to get all these additional capabilities. But given that I'm now restricting where I'm going to be with it, maybe then I know that I'll have certain resources nearby. Uh, I may have certain computational resources. I may have certain network resources. I don't have to make sure that it works everywhere all the time. I guess from a high level view, I would say we can't, it's going to be a very long time before we can build our Nirvana device where we don't have compromises. So we have to think through what are the compromises, what makes sense, what actually is, is useful. The other thing is, is there's, there's very clearly, in a new device like this, a chicken and egg problem. Nobody wants to buy a device until there are applications. Nobody wants to develop applications if there's no installed base, right? So you have to break through that somehow. We're seeing this play out in VR right now, um, and it's playing out slowly, right? You have, you have um, uh, Oculus spending a lot of money trying to generate content. Uh, you don't have a lot of very big players yet that are jumping in and spending you know, large sums of money to make um, high AAA titles that are designed for, for VR. Um, why? How many are they going to sell it to, right? There's only, in terms of high-end systems, the installed base right now is tiny. There's no way you could make money on that. So very much like the, the gaming consoles where you have to expect to lose money for, for a considerable amount of time, then you start to get the content. Um, We'll see that sort of play out, but that's playing out today in VR. I'll argue that AR is much more difficult. I don't think it's that hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's time, it's money, resources. But if you have a compelling piece of content, which is you know, a PC game or something like that, and you say, hey, I want to move this to VR, um, you have to you know, use some ingenuity to do it really well. But it's not, um, it doesn't involve any unknown technologies. You could, today, you could take a AAA title, uh, a game, and you could say, all right, I'm going to make this into a VR title, and this is how many people it's going to take, and I could schedule it all out, and you know how much it's going to cost. There aren't a lot of mysteries there, right? Talk about AR, you're in a different situation. If you truly want to have, in a typical VR, you know, in a game, for example, you know the geometry. Not, not any issue there. You can plan everything out. AR, you have to have uh, a way of authoring things which can deal with 
unexpected objects, right? Geometry that you did not anticipate. Um, it may have to do strange path planning. It may have to do, um, uh, you know, just even locomoting over weird surfaces, right? And making that look uh, reasonable if you're doing a, a game. That's, that's not uh, trivial at all. That's tech which is now coming of age and it has very different computational demands than traditional games, which have been able to, 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 to avoid that. And I think if you start to, if those things start to be, you know, the killer apps, the things that drive the usage, then that's going to affect what you want on the chips. Um, the chicken egg problem is an interesting problem, and, and certainly what we see in some places, for some markets, it's sort of the industrial professional product which gets things rolling and starts to generate some volume which eventually pulls the consumer market behind that. In AR, what do you see as being the differences in what the technical requirements are? Say, what's going to affect the silicon for a professional market versus uh, a consumer market? Uh, Price is obviously different. It's almost the definition of the consumer market. It's the price insensitive uh, sort of early version of it. But technically, it has often been the two or three year out forecast of what the consumer product could look like. So what in the case of uh, AR silicon platforms you think is relevant about the professional industrial product with relationship to the consumer product? Well, just to make a quick comment, I, you know, I think in the long run, mm -hmm. I don't see the difference. You know, the same way, you know, you don't have an enterprise smartphone and a, you know, a, a, a consumer smartphone. You, no, you have an you enterprise, you do have an enterprise laptop <laughs> versus yeah. a consumer laptop yeah, but it's to some extent. ruggedized or, but I think yeah. the main ingredients are not that different. Yeah. Um, so, so I do see that um, in AR, you know, today, you know, we see a lot of applications in, um, I mean, I'm talking about HMD, a, a, a dedicated device in enterprise, more because of cost, as you say, mm -hmm. and some of the form factors. Mm -hmm. Right. So today, they, I mean, some of them are, are still big, you know, for people to use it on a, right. your, your everyday life. But um, I think to the point where maybe I'm going to use an example. I'm not sure how many of you noticed, you know, the glass that I was uh, using here. I was trying to pretend it was my sunglass, but yeah. it's uh, actually um, um, an ODG, um, an ODG smart glass with a Snapdragon um, uh, A35. <laughs> right? so, yeah, I couldn't resist making a little advertisement. But, um, um, you know, they, they made, you know, Snapdragon 835, very small PCB here, right? So, you know, can put it here. I mean, it almost looks you know, usable. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, it's still targeted at, uh, at enterprise, right? Because, well, cost, I mean, it's not light enough, not, you know, for you to use it right. every day. And because you have to pay people to use it. <laughs> And, 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 then, and then I think that's, <laughs> that's, that's maybe the short term. But, uh, but I think that's on the hardware side. And one thing when I look at the, the, form, the earlier comment about uh, application and how do we break that chicken yeah. and egg, I, I like pretty much what uh, our friend Johnny you know, is doing with, uh, with Tango. Yeah. Right? So if I see... The video he showed earlier this uh, morning with Clay, you know, walking, walking on Lowe's. I mean, that was all using a smartphone. But imagine exactly that use case on, I mean, right. it works. It works pretty well. Mm -hmm. so, so I think um, uh, the ecosystem, right, of apps for uh, consumer, mm -hmm. I think we'll start with uh, smartphone AR-based apps. Yeah. Once you have the device, when you break that barrier of having a, yeah. a glass that you can wear the whole day, well, apps... You know, there are some apps that are already going to come from uh, the, the smartphone space. Yeah. Meng? I want to make uh, two comments. Uh, one is uh, I still think the computing is not enough. And then we, you know, whatever you do is uh, not enough. So, but I, the fact I bring in the um, perception model, this is uh, this, just like always we're doing graphics. Uh, graphics is, uh, is a field of uh, approximation. We're always falling around. We never make the real physics simulation. So when the world is uh, coming to the AR, VR from the traditional graphics, when you're having the monitor this far away, now it's here, right? So it's actually a lot more challenge. But in the same time, you have a lot more to play. 
I think uh, not necessarily you need to make everything crystal sharp, right? Only maybe this uh, foyer center area need to be very sharp, and everything else may be just a blur. And, and I think this is uh, something we need to uh, rethink about at a very fundamental level, how to change our computing and how to change our architect. The other thing is, uh, for instance, I noticed that our uh, current, I don't know whether you guys, but the ISP becomes extremely complicated these days. We need to have many, many pipelines to clean up the pictures. And so whether this is the, the right way of doing it or maybe this is, uh, should be the, the way we were doing the shaders many years ago, we need to, you know, uh, doing some kind of <coughs> uh, adding more flexibility there, making things, uh, you know, consolidated, uh, make it more efficient. So some of those things we need to consider so that we can really um, take this uh, big uh, compu computation requirement but still form into a very extremely constrained form factor. In terms of the consumer uh, application, uh, I, I actually really believe the, the future uh, hardware system should be driven by the application. Uh, who knows whether, I mean, there's a little application in China called WeChat. <laughs> actually become the most popular uh, mobile uh, computing platform right now, right? So I, I think it's, uh, um, it's probably a, um, you know, we need to go very diligently looking to all nations, many, many different countries and all cultures and to try to identify whether there's something very unique about that culture and make people stick to, I mean, try to use something on a daily or hour basis. That's going to be make the future AR VR device successful. Yeah. Let me break in for a moment. Um, if you have questions coming up, why don't you come up here, and that way we can get a microphone into your hand when you ask questions. The acoustics in the room are pretty bad, you may have noticed. So the microphone's important. So if you want to ask a question, kind of try and come forward so we can make sure. And other thoughts on consumer versus Professional equipment. I think, uh, I think it really depends on on the use cases, in particular, in the professional environment. So, obviously, you know, you know in the um, in the ARM ecosystem space, we see ARM uh, IP deployed in in phones as well as in things like cars, and the requirements in the car space are, are very different in terms of redundancy uh, and. Um, and uh, you know thermal requirements, and so will we see those same uh, requirements for industrial use of AR? If you're, I don't know, doing brain surgery and you have your AR glasses can't fail, I, I don't know. So I think it really depends on the use case. Yeah, one of the things which is very uh, striking about the current uh, headsets that we see so far is they're very rich in sensors, lots of cameras, lots of display, um, and. As we try to drive down cost and power, um, the question is, well, how much does the silicon platform matter? Does anybody have any sort of at least rough estimate or projection of the fraction of that cost and power budget, which is actually directly controlled by the silicon itself? Is our leverage on the silicon affecting 20% of the power or 60% of the power? And what are the things the silicon could be doing to improve the overall power, directly or indirectly? I think that, mean, that depends a lot on what power you're talking about is going to the sensors, right? If you, for example, say, okay, we have cameras and we have an ISP that's just taking that uh, camera image and it's debayering it or doing a few little things, well, that's not too bad. But if you say, I actually want to do object recognition, yeah. Um, right. I, might, I, I want to sense, um, you know, I want to sense depth. I want to, all of a sudden now you're, you're putting a lot more uh, demands on the on that silicon, and it becomes a, a much larger piece of the, yeah. the whole puzzle. Okay. Yeah, I, I would I would agree. I think that the uh, graphics and vision, I believe, you know, construed broadly, um, have the opportunity to use so much power, so much computing power that I'm not even sure we can put it all on the head, like, like I said okay. earlier. So, so I mean, now that depends. Like, do you need high-end graphics or is text enough? You know, is, is, is low-end crappy graphics enough? It totally depends on the application. And, and I do believe that there will be many instantiations along that sort of okay. trade-off curve. Uh, but, but I think that, um, that graphics to render to the display and especially computer vision to process what's coming in from those sensors and understanding is 
that processing will be dominant. I think that will dominate the, the sensors themselves. I think it will dominate and does dominate the, um, the actual display of the photons, the actual sort of photon production. So, so I, I believe the silicon is going to be the okay. dominant cost. Okay. So just to complement, I think uh, when I look at the bill of material of uh, you know, an AR device or even VR, I think today you know, display is a big portion of it. Yeah. Right? Uh, um, silicon overall um, also you know, uh, relevant. A part of the relevant, yeah, that's good. <laughs> of the of the bill of, uh, of material, but I think these are the two key. Now, how do you minimize the silicon um, uh, cost, right? So I think uh, uh, it really, I mean, not new, um, you know, from from us in the silicon uh, space, but it's really integration, yeah. right? So if you require to have multiple chips, right, to do an um, uh, an AR glass, well, first you have a PCB space problem but cost, right? If you have to use a coprocessor for vision, um, you know, a sensor hub uh, externally, an ISP, you know, I mean, it becomes very expensive. Yeah, yeah, right, sure. So I think, uh, you know, an integrated SOC that is a dimension for AR, I mean, that's how, you know, I think uh, was done on smartphone and needs to be replicated in AR. Great. I'd love to get a question from the audience. Come on forward here. Do we have a microphone? Yeah. Thanks, Dave. So I was thinking of a number of questions about, um, I'm trying to pick which one. <laughs> Choose um, one. <laughs> so yeah, one thing that, that is really important for developers is when you're trying to integrate with an SOC, right? And you get these really long data sheets and um, the more complex the SOC is, sometimes the harder it is to develop a wearable or some kind of application. So one question I have is, um, from your perspective, which of the SOCs, SOCs are going to be easiest for small groups to, to develop products on top of? And what is the role of open source hardware going to be from the perspective of your company in enabling those developers? Um, actually, we, we just have a recent uh, collaboration with ARM and uh, Google on this thing called HiKey. So it's uh, something like a, a, um, a um, with our Kirin uh, 960 and the future it would be 970 to you know, give it uh, um, very cheaply to the developer. You can use it as a platform to, to do some of the early uh, development. I think that that's uh, having a lot of very good uh, SOC function, and then you can use it uh, reasonably cheaply for a small startup or a research project. And, and just to tie that back to an earlier question about kind of lowering the, the, the barriers for finding the killer apps, I think it's mm -hmm. things like this that are going to be required. So silicon providers need to partner uh, with the software guys. We need to provide the the proper layers of abstraction and software so that we can kind of plant a, a thousand seeds and let guys get their hands dirty and, and invent those killer apps. Yeah. And uh, from the Intel side, um, there is uh, obviously there are certain chips where the support is very expensive and only goes to large customers, but we have um, a makers innovation group at Intel, which specifically builds, um, you know, small cheap SOCs uh, for uh, individuals to experiment with and build different projects with. So um, that's where you'll be able to find the kind of support that um, you would hope for as a, as a very small player. On a um, slightly different take on open source hardware, um, yesterday NVIDIA announced that we're essentially open, that we are open sourcing um, the DLA, the deep learning accelerator in our, in our latest chips. Uh, and that's a, you know, a small, a small sort of hard, you know, um, hardwired uh, unit built specifically for inference, low precision inference. Um, you know, so, so I think I think we and others are seeing the importance and benefit of that to to sort of help foster this ecosystem. Like we would rather have that ecosystem flourish. Nvidia is probably never going to make the chip that goes in a light bulb, but somebody will, right? And and you know, I think anything we can do to sort of help that help that that flourish. You know, for us in, in this case, it's deep learning, you know, something that we really want to see expand. Okay, great. Next question. So. It seems to me if we're evolving towards eyeglasses as a form factor for AR, that the compute is going to be offloaded. So fundamentally, that seems to be where we should be heading. Mm -hmm. You have sensors in the glasses. They transmit the data to your compute. Maybe it's your phone in your pocket. It comes back with you know, meaningful data that's displayed. Anyway, 
have you guys, it seems like heat dissipation is sort of the holy grail right. for whatever amount of compute and or sensors we have in the, in the wearable. Have you guys done work with like carbon nanotubes or any kind of crazy new sort of heat dissipation technologies? Because that seems fundamental to me. That's my question more like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, on, 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 the, on the silicon, I mean, we were doing reference designs so on the specifics on the, on the thermal um, uh, design. Uh, but, but we do see that uh, an all-in-one device is the uh, holy grail or where, where we want to be. Uh, I think, you know, offloading to a smartphone or a belt pack, I don't know, maybe, you know, initial, uh, initial designs will have that and mostly to, to the enterprise. But really, we have to look at um, you know all in one and and um, uh, passive, right? To to your point, um, we have done um, designs uh, and we work with OEMs actually, our customers, uh, to do these uh, thermal designs. Um, I I don't know any specific, but but I mean if you look at the, this design, I mean again it's uh, passively cooled and it was able to you know uh, do things uh, quite uh, properly. Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that AR is not the only application that cares intensely about power. I mean, mobile devices and IoT are all kind of pushing the envelope on it as well. And something like carbon nanotubes may be a factor, but it's going to be a, a rising tide that hopefully lifts many ships, right. uh, not just this one. Yeah, let's take, let's take another one. Hi. Uh, so uh, I guess it's not surprising that there's a lot of discussion about hardware in this session. <laughs> it sort of was in the name. <laughs> right, right. But I, I thought Michael Cass had a, a really good point about the, the killer app. You know, and he used the example of VisiCalc. So I'm just curious, and I, I have an answer to this, but I'm going to ask you first to see what you think about it. Um, why do you think VisiCalc was a killer app? Um, why do I think? Actually, I mean, obviously people figured out use after use after use for it. Um, I, I actually haven't studied the, right. the details of the adoption, okay. so, but okay, well, are you well, going to tell well, us a story? I have a thought on it. it. It made possible something that people were already doing, and it made it a lot easier. Right. And I think that's, that's sort of the essence of, of, of what, 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 what can but, catch on as a killer app. But right. it, it's something that's already going on, and suddenly there's this new technique, and you know, when Dan Brick, Brixton first wrote it, the performance was awful. He wrote it in basic. And it was, it was really sluggish. It was only when it was rewritten in assembly code that it started really to, to be obviously useful to people, uh, oh aside from the people who could, who could, who could uh, imagine it going faster. But I think that's, that's the touchstone of, of a killer well, app. Something I absolutely that, agree. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's, it's way easier to introduce a new device that does something that you already do but does it better, right? right. Um, and, and, you know, in a way, you could think of the current VR devices a little bit in that direction, that, you, you know, you can take a game that you were playing before, you do it in VR, now you have this immersive experience, the whole thing is better, but you could be doing basically the same kind of game that you were doing before. I think AR is going to have a harder, a slower adoption curve because it's going to, in order to really take advantage of it, you have to be doing something that is different. And if you look at why, you know, in my estimation, part of the success of, of the, uh, the iPhone and the rapid success was when it, out of the box it did things that you already did but did them better, right? That's so exactly right. it yeah. played music, it mm -hmm. surfed the web, right? It made phone calls. You already did all those things. And here was a device that now improved your life because it did all those things better in one place. And so... AR has that challenge that it's not, uh, I haven't seen anybody lay out a list of things that you already do um, that you're going to do in a similar way with AR. I think you're going to do different things with AR, and that's why it's going to be um, a challenge. Well, that's why it's harder to find a killer app for AR. So you, so you, don't, you, don't, think, you don't think you can just become your smartphone interface. My smartphone becomes a lozenge in my pocket that maybe even has a physical keyboard if I need it, but mostly I just, it's mostly it's just, you know, Speech and gesture and... Speech, gesture, and if I, I mean, or typing, whatever, you know, but the point is it's not, it doesn't have to be this slick, thin yeah. thing with a big screen. I don't know. That, 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 it, I, I would almost put what you said in the opposite direction. I'd say Air's going to have a really hard time catching on if it doesn't, as, as the one device, right, if it doesn't do what I already want, what I already carry a phone to do, and I already carry a phone to do an awful lot of things. But I think it's going to, I think it does a, some of those things worse, 
right? In other words, let's say I want to watch a video. I can have it floating here with... Yeah, an iPhone's way worse than the phone to replace as a phone. So it does something better, but something's worse, arguably. Yeah. Right. Maybe. I'm going to take these last two questions and wrap up. So keep the questions short, because I know we're standing between us and mm -hmm. something Most. even more fun. So short questions, fairly short answers. I'll, I'll try to make it short. Uh, this is nice because I get to ask uh, guys a question without having to schedule individual meetings with everyone. Uh, but, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so we all are excited about when AR is a high volume, but then uh, there's no applications to get there yet. So uh, it takes someone to prime the pump with either a first product or developer kits or reference designs. And you know, one of the challenges, at least I have, at least inside of Google and we're working with partners, is you know, who's going to take the first bet or how do we make a few thousand units or tens of thousands of units uh, with the right set of partners to s help find the applications. So I was kind of wondering, you know, within your respective companies, uh, what the risk tolerance is from your leadership on building basically dev kit volume prototypes to actually get uh, developer ecosystem started. I can start. I mean, um, we, we at Qualcomm, I mean, we, we decided to start with a VR reference design, right? Um, I mean, we, based on Snapdragon 820, we, we, I think uh, Gerhard on, on the last uh, uh, presentation, he showed it, where we, we created a reference design. Um, and of course, it's uh, occluded, so it's a VR. But I mean, it's, I, I think, I mean, it's a platform to get started. Um, I'm going to reference again my friends at uh, ODG who actually use that as a reference to build uh, this uh, from uh, schematics and um, uh, from a, a hardware perspective. That's how we're thinking. Um, AR, uh, we do think we need a reference design um, that is a little bit more uh, form factor. Uh, but that's, uh, yeah, that's probably the next step, going from our VR reference design to an um, uh, AR glass type of reference design. Okay. Hey, hi. I have a question. I probably will start with you. You keep comparing AR and phone requirements for the SOC and yeah. saying that in the future it will merge. But, you know, uh, working both on iPhone and HoloLens, I know firsthand that the amount of sensory data and computation and the latency requirements are very different, though the phone is already working really well and AR is just starting, and it will have more sensors, it will have eye tracking, it will have more. So eventually, uh, silicons like you showed in ODG, ODG is a great product, but it doesn't have much sensors, and it has a little bit of tracking, but not what we were talking today about, like object, uh, object recognition, the surface recognition, that's all. So question for you, are you seeing that eventually there will be a hybrid chips with like sense, visual sensor uh, kind of like ASICs inside? And if you see that, uh, what happens with uh, the thermal story? Because again, more computation, one chip, more thermal. So it's kind of like, you know, we, we will be going rounds and the bigger, bigger thermal envelope, the heavier device. And if you cannot move it in a pocket because of the latency, then we're kind of stuck. <clears throat> So uh, you may know that Intel recently acquired Movidius. Um, Movidius has some products which are yes. able to, are very well suited to the kinds of um, computation that you're talking about. They absolutely fit within uh, mobile power envelopes. Um, they fit within power ratings that you can put, you know, on a head-worn device. And so that's a very uh, interesting market to, um, to Intel. Yeah. Yeah, I want to address the issue. I think uh, uh, AI is probably going to change everything. So this is probably another thing so we can consider intelligently uh, solving the problem <coughs> using the, you know, uh, carefully analyze the usage model, try to identify whether there is something interesting happen or there's something never, I mean, it's a very boring period, which, which you can completely shut down or semi shut down the, the sensor part. So that way, it's a, it's a reasonable solution. I wouldn't say it's a, it's a solving for everything, but this is a problem can help. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, the only last comment is uh, also on our reference design, our ref VR reference design, uh, we are able already to have uh, eye tracking um, and stereo, uh, uh, stereo cameras, you know, looking forward. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we already have proof of four cameras 
Do we believe that in the future we will need more cameras? Yes. Right, so you'll need maybe one looking back. Uh, I mean, sure, sure, maybe sure, like sure. The, the, the HoloLens uh, implementation, you have four looking uh, forward. And one in your pocket, too. In your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, we want to have a, you know, a 360, uh, if not a 720 you know, uh, uh, view. Um, I, I think that's the direction we're, we're going. I think the, the point, I'm going to uh, go back to my uh, colleague from uh, Intel, uh, saying, well, in a first phase, use silicon that you already have. In a second phase, well, you increment, you know, and that's what the phase we are right now. Two years ago, we already started changing our SOC for lower latency, for head tracking, and, and so forth. And, and I think everyone in the silicon space is taking, you know, the approach of, I mean, how do we evolve this, right? Without having, a, you know, 100 million uh, units of AR glasses out there, I mean, how do you, you know, uh, do it step by step? I think that's probably a good point to stop on. Um, we're now at least 15 minutes over schedule. So please join me in thanking the panelists.